Well, happy Easter, everyone. I'm thrilled that you're joining us this morning and so grateful for what God is doing in our lives. I don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead to be a distant or silent observer. I believe that he's present and he has something to say to us. I believe he's present with you right now and I believe he wants to speak into our lives. And so we come together this morning to look into his word to see what he has to say to us. I'm in Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 36. It says, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. And he said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that was written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. And he told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. I don't think anyone likes to look foolish. We don't like to be made fun of. We don't like to appear gullible or naive. And so I think there is a real question that's worth asking. Is there credible evidence for the resurrection? If there were a trial in a courtroom, would the verdict of a jury be that Christ rose from the dead? And what is the evidence that might be presented in such a trial? And the truth is, is that there were over 500 witnesses, eyewitnesses to the resurrected Jesus. And in fact, when much of the New Testament was written, they were still alive. You could actually go and talk to them and have them share their own story in their own words. Now, there were powerful forces that were opposed to any teaching about resurrection. And they could impose pain and torture. They could put people in prison. They even put people to death. And yet these eyewitnesses kept telling their story because they weren't afraid of death anymore. They saw that there was something beyond this life and actually better than this life. And then there was an empty tomb. If Jesus' body still was in the grave, all anyone had to do was go bring that body out and Christianity would have been stopped immediately in its tracks. But there was no body to be brought out. And in those days, the graves of people who were considered holy or who were considered important were venerated. They became like holy sites. And within just a few short years, no one knew where the grave of Jesus was any longer because it wasn't considered holy because his body wasn't there. And then there's some insights we can actually gain from the stories that were told about Jesus after his resurrection. They seem very ordinary. In fact, the one that we just read from Luke, it tells us that Jesus talks to them, he shows them his wounds, and he speaks to them, and then he has a meal with them. He eats some broiled fish. Jesus doesn't seem to do any special miracles or take his, his followers to some special place and then bring them back. He simply eats with them. Is that the story you would tell if you were making something up? It's very ordinary. And then there are cultural problems that are built into the resurrection story. There, to be sure, people who lived back then didn't have access to our technology. Most of what we use every day would seem like magic to them. But to say that because they didn't have technology that they were unintelligent would not be a very appropriate thing to, uh, to be able to say. The truth is, is that they were intelligent. 
and they didn't believe that people came back from the dead. Even among the Jewish faith, they did believe that one day there would be a resurrection, but it was only after God had made everything right in the world, and then all of the faithful would be resurrected at the same time. This idea that someone would be a forerunner or there would be a solo or an individual resurrection was completely opposed to Jewish theology. And so they would not have accepted that. And then there were the Greeks and the Romans who actually considered the physical body to be something that was corruptible. It would wear down and it would wear out. It would get old. And, and they thought that to die was to finally be free from the body. So the idea of resurrecting and getting your body back was something that they didn't agree with at all. So these followers of Jesus were actually claiming something that no one in their culture thought was possible and ideologically they were opposed to. So why would they say that unless it was true? And then there's also the idea that women were included as witnesses. Believe it or not, there was a time in history when women were not believed. I know, you're as surprised as I am. They had no rights and very little credibility. If there was a man and a woman who both witnessed the same thing, they would never use the testimony of the woman in that situation, only the testimony of the man. And yet, in the gospel accounts, we hear time after time the testimony of women. Why would they include the testimony of women if they were just making up a story? The resurrection story it's not a, carely, a carefully crafted tale by men who have something to gain. It was a very powerful truth that cost them everything they had. That's what was true. It was so true, they didn't care what anyone else thought. They just had to tell the truth. So Jesus was meeting with his friends and his followers, and he was encouraging them, and he was actually preparing them for some things that were about to occur in their life. And it raises the question, First of all, why would Jesus come to us to begin with? Secondly, why would Jesus die for us? And then thirdly, why would he rise from the dead? And what would he do then? And is he just performing a magic trick? Is he, is he trying to prove how powerful he is? And here's what's true. Jesus was on a mission, a mission that he never wavered from any day of his life. And it's told us in Luke, the 10th chapter, the 10th verse. The Son of Man has come to seek out and to give life to those who are lost. Let me say that again. The Son of Man has come to seek out and to give life to those who are lost. Jesus came searching for and giving to the lost. There's a problem. And the problem is none of us want to be considered or defined as lost. We don't like to admit that we don't know where we are or we don't know where we are going. So Jesus had a way of helping us understand what that means. One of the things Jesus liked to do was to bring two crowds of people together who had very different views in life. He actually believed that if you could get people together who didn't see eye to eye, it was actually a teaching opportunity. There were some things that he could clarify. And in Luke chapter 15, he does this. There's a crowd of religious experts and people who are very knowledgeable of scripture, and they're very proud of the kind of lives that they are living. And there's also a crowd of people who the Bible describes as notorious sinners. And Jesus decides these two groups should get together. And he brings them together, and then he begins to tell a story actually three stories in succession. And he needs both groups to be able to hear something that I think it would be helpful for us to hear. He tells stories, these three stories, to tell us who, who is really lost, what is the definition of being lost, and then what is the heart of God towards those who are lost. So the first story is the story of a lost sheep. There's a shepherd, he has 100 sheep, and one of the sheep wanders off. The sheep isn't trying to escape. It's not attempting to do something bad. It's just not paying attention. It's not aware of what the environment is, and it just wanders off. And the challenge is, is that there's real danger for this sheep. The countryside, the, 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 it's not safe. There are predators. There are dangers that exist there. And so this shepherd 
leaves the 90 and 9 and goes and finds this one sheep and brings it back. You know, in our world, there are things that we thought we were aware of, and this season has proven to us there's a lot we didn't know. Any source of confidence that we have about being able to control our lives is born a lot more out of our ignorance than out of our knowledge or our ability. And Jesus says, if you don't actually know what the risks are in this world where there is real good and evil, where there is real life and death, where there is real health and sickness, if you don't actually know the risks, then you're lost. And then he tells a second story. The second story has to do with a story of a lost coin. There's a woman, she's got 10 coins, and they're important to her, and she loses one of them. And the Bible says that she goes through and sweeps through every nook and cranny of her house. She will not stop until she has found this lost coin, which sounds like a lot of work to go through for a single coin. But that's because we don't know the value of that coin to her. There are a lot of people who think they're not worth very much either. They've been told that they're worthless or they're useless by people who exercise some power over them at some point in their life. And God doesn't say that about you. If you ever wonder what your value is to God, you can look at the cross. He was willing to give his one and only son to get you. That's your value. So according to Jesus, if you don't know your full value, you are lost. And then there's a story of two lost sons. The younger brother's identity was all wrapped up in material things and in physical pleasure. He wanted to have a lot of fun, and he wanted to have a lot of things. And if he didn't have enough stuff and he didn't have enough fun, he didn't know who he was. He just kind of lost his sense of identity. And he actually, at the end of the story, returns to his father, and he says, I'm, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. He, he doesn't know who he is anymore. The older brother also has an identity issue. His identity is all wrapped up in the rules that he keeps. His ability to keep rules made him feel superior to other people who weren't so good at keeping rules. And he couldn't understand why you would ever give anything to anyone whose will wasn't as strong as his. Without rules to keep, he didn't know who he was. There's a party at the end of the story, and he thinks going in the party is violating a rule. And we don't know what he decides. According to Jesus, if you don't know who you are, you are lost. Well, Jesus is meeting with this group of people in the gospel that we just read in Luke. And he shows them his wounds, and he shows them his scars. And he isn't just recounting a harrowing tale of what he's been through or providing evidence of what he has endured. He's teaching. Again, God uses the painful things and the awful things in our lives to work redemption. That God can work in any trial and through every tear into his glorious plan. But, first, you have to be found. For all of God's plan to work in our lives, we have to be found. And honestly, it takes a lot of humility to admit that we are lost. Humility is really a form of courage. It's a decision that I will not pretend anymore. I will not hide anymore. As flawed and imperfect as I am, I want to be seen. I want to be found. For example, if you were on a plane and it crashed and you woke up from an unconscious state laying on a beach surrounded by wreckage and no other people around, wouldn't you want to be found? You would light fires and you would do anything you could to call attention to anyone that would be going by so that you could be found and that you could be rescued. It's time to be seen. It's time to be found. It's time to be rescued. If you don't know the risks, if you don't know your full value, if you don't know who you really are, it's time 
to be found by the God who is looking for you. That brings us to this moment. You can be found. The problem is not if God is looking hard enough. He's fully committed to this. The question is, do you want to be found? And if you in this conversation today have come to realize that you don't know your value and you don't know the risks and you don't really know who you are, then maybe this is the resurrected Jesus opportunity to speak to you. You can be found and seen and rescued today. So right now, uh, there's going to be some information on the screen. And if you're watching live online, there's going to be some links that are available for you to click on. And you can make a decision today. You can be seen. You can be found. So Heavenly Father, just as we're about to head into this reflective moment and, and hear your praises sung again, would you help us today hear your voice fresh in our own hearts and respond to you? We want to be seen. We want to be found. In Jesus' name, amen.